Through the use of non-graphic animation, this DVD depicts the two most common methods of induced abortion. It also includes a partial list of the injuries and complications known to occur as a result of these procedures. In a pregnant uterus, the placenta supplies oxygen and nutrients to the fetus and carries away carbon dioxide and other wastes. Attached to the placenta is the umbilical cord, which carries blood back and forth between the fetus and the placenta. The fetus and the fluid surrounding it are contained within the amniotic sac. Suction curatage is the type of procedure most frequently used to accomplish abortions in the first trimester. This procedure begins with the insertion of a speculum, which enlarges the opening of the vagina. After painkillers, normally lidocaine or xylocaine, are injected around the cervix, a sharp grasping instrument called a tenaculum is locked onto the cervix and pulled until the uterus is brought in line with the vaginal canal. In order to accommodate the instruments necessary to continue the abortion, the cervical opening is then enlarged through the use of cervical dilators. These dilators come in a range of sizes and progressively larger ones are used to achieve greater dilation. In the procedure depicted here, two sizes are being used. Next, a hollow plastic tube called a cannula is inserted into the uterus. This tube is attached to a suction machine by way of a flexible hose. As the machine is turned on, the fetus, amniotic sac, and fluid will be sucked out of the uterus. Then, tong-like devices called forceps are used to remove any fetal parts or tissue missed during this vacuuming process, including whatever remains of the umbilical cord or placenta. Once that's completed, a metal rod with a loop on the end, called a curette, is scraped along the inside wall of the uterus to dislodge any remaining tissue or placental matter. After that, the suction cannula is again inserted into the uterus in order to remove the tissue that was dislodged by the curette. When the uterus is empty, the tenaculum is released and the uterus returns to its normal position. After the speculum is removed, the procedure is complete. For second and third trimester abortions, the most common procedure is dilation and evacuation, or D&D. &D. Although the instruments used in a D&E &E are basically the same as those used in a suction curatage, the procedures differ in several important ways. First, because the fetus is considerably larger at this stage of pregnancy, a greater degree of cervical dilation is required. This dilation is accomplished in multiple steps, which means that most d &E abortions take more than one day to complete. On the first day, the patient's vaginal opening is enlarged through the use of a speculum. Then a tenaculum is locked onto the cervix and pulled until the uterus is brought in line with the vaginal canal. Next, the cervical dilation process begins with the insertion of a compressed seaweed product called laminaria. Before insertion, and it's not unusual for more than one laminaria stick to be inserted at a time, the depth of the cervical canal is measured with a thin metal rod called a sound. Once that's done, forceps are used to insert the laminaria and place gauze over the mouth of the cervix. The tenaculum is then released and the speculum is removed. As the laminaria absorbs moisture from the cervix, it expands and dilates the cervical opening. This process generally takes several hours to complete, but in the case of very late-term procedures, it can take two or three days. In some instances, subsequent laminaria installations are required in order to achieve the necessary dilation. After the stage of the dilation process has been completed, the speculum is again inserted and the gauze removed.
The tenaculum is then used to pull the uterus back in line with the vaginal canal and the laminaria is removed. Next, greater dilation is achieved with the same progressively larger cervical dilators used in the suction curatage abortion. Once the cervix is sufficiently dilated, a cannula is inserted and the amniotic sac and fluid are sucked out. Even though the cervix is far more dilated in a D&E than in a suction curatage, the fetus is so much larger that it must be dismembered inside the womb and removed in pieces. Forceps are used to accomplish this and to remove the remainder of the umbilical cord. After this process has been completed, a curette is scraped along the inside wall of the uterus to dislodge any remaining tissue or placental matter. Then, the suction cannula is again used to remove whatever tissue was dislodged by the curette. The uterus is empty, the tenaculum is released, the speculum is removed, and the procedure is complete. The female reproductive system is a delicate environment where mistakes are not well tolerated. Even the smallest errors can have serious and sometimes fatal consequences. In both suction curatage and D&D procedures, the most common source of injury is tissue or fetal parts that are missed and left in the uterus. This situation often goes unnoticed and therefore untreated. In those cases, if the material is not passed naturally, it can decompose inside the patient's uterus and trigger a septic infection. Even with proper medical treatment, if this infection attacks the woman's reproductive system, she may lose her ability to have additional children. In some cases, the patient will experience bleeding that is heavy enough to require a transfusion or hysterectomy. Occasionally, the infection will enter the woman's bloodstream and attack vital organs. In the most serious of these instances, she will die. Uterine scarring is common in both suction curatage and D&E procedures. It is generally caused by the curette as it scrapes tissue from the wall of the uterus. If the lining of the uterus is damaged during this process, the result can be endometritis or Asherman syndrome, either of which can lead to infertility. Uterine perforation is a potentially fatal injury that occurs when instruments are pushed through the wall of the uterus. Also, if the open end of the cannula inadvertently attaches to the uterine wall, the vacuum level generated by the suction machine can be enough to suck a hole in the uterus. The bleeding which accompanies a uterine injury can be heavy enough to require a transfusion or hysterectomy. A uterine perforation can also create a weak spot in the uterus which ruptures during a future pregnancy. Like uterine scarring, a uterine perforation increases the risk that the patient's subsequent pregnancies will be ectopic, end in miscarriage, or be complicated by high-risk conditions such as placenta previa. When the tenaculum is used to pull the uterus into position, a laceration can develop at the point where it was attached to the cervix. The cervix can also be ripped if the metal dilators are too large or used with too much force. On the other hand, too little dilation can result in the cervix being torn when the instruments used later in the procedure are forced through the undersized cervical opening. A cervical injury can also result if the suction machine is activated before the open end of the cannula is fully inside the uterus. 
The suction machine used in abortion procedures can generate enough force to rip a hole in the patient's cervix or vaginal wall. Injuries to the cervix may require a blood transfusion, hysterectomy, or other major surgery. For other cervical injury patients, the cervix may be damaged or weakened to the point that any future pregnancies will either miscarry or require a cerclage. Because the uterus is located near the bladder and intestines, a uterine perforation will often result in lacerations to them or other nearby organs. For example, intestines are sometimes pulled through the perforation into the uterus and out through the vagina. This can cause a loss of bowel function, resulting in a colostomy. In other cases, the woman's bladder may be lacerated or punctured. In those instances, the patient may lose the ability to control her urine flow. Another nearby maternal structure is the uterine artery. This close proximity makes it particularly vulnerable to damage any time a uterine perforation or cervical injury occurs. This is a critical issue because the uterine artery carries such an enormous volume of blood during pregnancy that lacerations to it can be fatal. Another type of collateral damage relates to bacterial infection and sexually transmitted diseases. The instruments used during an abortion procedure will often spread these types of infections into the woman's upper genital tract. This can cause pelvic inflammatory disease, which has now been identified as a major contributing factor to both infertility and ectopic pregnancy. In both suction curatage and D&D procedures, injuries such as a uterine perforation or cervical laceration create the possibility of massive blood loss or hemorrhage. D&D abortions can also produce a potentially fatal hemorrhage even when there is no underlying injury inflicted on the patient. In addition to hemorrhaging, embolisms can occur when the abortion procedure causes air, amniotic fluid, or blood clots to enter the patient's bloodstream. This material then circulates through the woman's body and in the majority of cases she will die. Autopsies performed on patients who have died from abortion-induced embolisms often reveal parts of the fetus, such as hair and bone shards in the deceased woman's brain, lungs, heart, liver, or kidneys. Another blood-related complication seen in DNA abortions is disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. Similar to an embolism, DIC occurs when the abortion procedure causes foreign matter to enter the patient's bloodstream. This can radically alter the clotting mechanisms of her blood and result in major long-term damage to vital organs. The most dangerous aspect of DIC is that it can develop even when the abortion procedure is performed properly. If not treated immediately and correctly, DIC will usually cause the woman's death. A significant percentage of abortion injuries and complications are related to the painkillers injected into the cervix or the drugs used for anesthesia. These chemicals can produce breathing difficulties, irregular heartbeats, convulsions, seizures, or cardiorespiratory arrest. When those events occur, the woman involved is at an elevated risk of sustaining permanent brain damage, lapsing into a coma, being left in a permanent vegetative state, or dying. Following a first trimester suction curatage abortion, the symptoms of an undiagnosed ectopic or tubal pregnancy are often either overlooked or dismissed as normal postoperative discomfort or cramping. That can be a fatal mistake. When a woman has an abortion while carrying an undiagnosed ectopic pregnancy, she will almost inevitably remain pregnant after the procedure. In most cases, the fetus will continue to grow inside her fallopian tube until the tube ruptures and causes a massive hemorrhage. This will often result in the woman bleeding to death before emergency treatment can be rendered. In less serious cases, she may lose the fallopian tube and significantly decrease her ability to have children in the future. The laminaria used to accomplish the initial dilation in DNA abortions can cause cervical injuries. These compressed seaweed sticks do not always expand evenly, sometimes becoming larger on the ends than in the middle. When that happens, the risk of a cervical laceration increases. Laminaria can also be broken off or become stuck in the cervix. In other cases, a laminaria is accidentally pushed through the side wall of the cervix during insertion. If that situation goes undetected, the laminaria will rip the cervix as it expands. 
The symptoms of an abortion injury are not always evident at the time of the procedure. For example, if uterine scarring has left a woman sterile, she may not know about it until she tries to get pregnant sometime in the future. There is also a growing body of evidence that having an abortion may significantly increase a woman's risk of developing breast cancer later in life. Additionally, other medical research indicates incidence of cervical and colon cancer. It is also known that there can be profound psychological and emotional consequences associated with the abortion decision, and that these problems may not be attributed to the abortion until many years later. Women who undergo abortions are exposed to many serious and life-threatening injuries that were not described in this DVD. Women should not consider elective abortion until they are fully aware of its physical and emotional risks, as well as the alternatives that are available to them.